Good morning, fellow ruminators. Welcome back to another session of Rumination with Andrew. Thank you so much for joining as we are about to discuss a very important topical matter. And this morning, we are going to look at the topic from Michael Manley, considered to be one of Jamaica's most progressive politicians, to Nigel Clark, right? Um, who is the current finance minister, the minister of finance in Jamaica, and one who is a passionate advocate of neoliberalism, the institutions which he represents. So we must understand that our world has changed from the old Cold War, the Cold War of the Soviet Union, the, that, that competition that was between the United States and the Soviet Union. And what we have now is that the United States is the superpower, is the lone power in the world. Sometimes she calls herself the indispensable economic and political and military power, which is the United States of America. Now, what does the IMF has to do with this sort of Cold War um, competition, right? This Cold War sort of, you know, literary and political warfare in the world. What we need to understand is that economics play a very important role in any empire cementing its role, right, and its hegemony in the world. And the United States, as we suggested on previous occasions, is seeking to um, achieve full spectrum dominance. And the only way it can achieve that if it has complete, right, on parallel military, economic, and political control or dominance over the entire globe, over the entire globe. Now, we see that Nigel Clark is taking a position at the IMF. He's going to be one of the deputy managing directors at the International Monetary Fund, for those of you who do not know. Now, um, Nigel Clark, for those of you who also are not aware of this information, is the current Minister of Finance in Jamaica. What I find very interesting is that they, the ministers in Jamaica, the, the politicians in Jamaica, and also economic elites, they tend to encourage Jamaica to remain in the country and to develop the country. Yet still, they are not willing and that they're not committed just to remain in Jamaica and develop Jamaica, because I'm sure that the monetary rewards and the prestige that Dr. Nigel Clark is being offered. He cannot decline, right? He has to go because the fact of the matter, he has to think himself first. So remember now that even public servants, and we are not knocking him for that, all right, think of themselves first. What we don't like is for them to give us this illusion that our economy is doing well when it is not doing well. Another thing, and I'm just going to show you a video before I... Um, let me show you the video before I actually comment on that. So let me show you this video that I found on TikTok, which is sort of articulating very well my sentiments about Dr. Nigel's Clark, Dr. Dr. Nigel Clark's impending departure from Jamaica to take up to assume a position at the International Monetary Fund as one of its deputy managing directors all right so let me have you listen to that video let me share my screen first and have you listen to that video all right so let's get there let's go down get down with business ah where is it um where is it lord okay let me come out of the screen because if i don't then i'm not going to find it so it's important for us to right pull it up and then now I will share my screen with you. Sometimes the technicalities here can be overwhelming. I need a producer, right? <laughs> okay, so let's go now to sharing with you what this these people are saying about Dr. Nigel Clark's departure. You see, as you are reading the newspaper, and she said, Nigel Clark get big position. I mean, I've been following you, and I, I, I. I look at the consistency in him at being a labor right. He thinks he's going to green up us, yes. But he is the epitome, the epitome of a hypocrite. Because you cannot be in a country that you are the finance minister and you are saying you are here 
to guide the country through rough waters and know that the country is in very rough and deep waters. And your job ship. So all oh, them want the doctor and the nurses and the, and the teachers to stay when the very same politician them are lead. That's how hypocritical they are. That they are telling you, tighten your belt, you must bear it. You understand? You must bear it. But him jumped ship and gone to greener pastures. Very disgraceful. Hypocrisy. Very disgraceful. At its highest order. Very disgraceful. And, and we have to realize that these people don't really mean Jamaica any good. They mean themselves. Okay. Very egoistic. And this is why they would okay a 200% increase for parliamentarians, but 10% for teachers and 5% for police and others. Shameful. Yeah, this man is correct. And we wish that his sentiments were actually coming from the University of the West Indies or from the universities of Jamaica. But these sentiments are not coming from there, right? If you notice, they're coming from the working class, from the common man, they're the ones who are able to analytically look at the system in an objective manner and make an intelligent comment. The people who are at universities tend to be beholden to theories and the theoretical frameworks and their heads are firmly planted into their books, right? In their books, they're not ready and prepared to render an intelligent commentary on what is happening to the Jamaica's um, economic landscape. Right, because we know that, as the man suggested, that Nigel Clark is telling us that we should ban our bellies and we should be prepared for austerity. Right, that was imposed by the International Monetary Fund. Right, because that is how he got his position. And you know, Nigel Clark used to work for Goldman Sachs in the United Kingdom. He also played. He also had uh, roles. He worked at the International. Um, is it the International Development Bank, right? So, and he has, you know, worked in the Jamaican banking system. So he is no stranger to austerity and to the private sector. And he is going to work within their favor. He is going to render policies that, um, of course, are in their best interest as opposed to the interest of the Jamaican people. That is what we have to understand. But we tend to look at our politicians as people who are telling us the truth. We tend to worship them and we look at, you know, the we look at them through a political or partisan lens. So when you speak about what is happening, people are going to attack me and say that, wow, I'm bad mind because I do not wish Dr. Nigel Clark well. I do wish Dr. Nigel Clark well, and I'm suggesting if he was a private citizen who, of course, had not had anything to do with government and had nothing to do with the IMF um, policies, the austerity that, you know, has been implemented in Jamaica, then I would say, go ahead. You know, who cares what Dr. Nella Clark does or does not do, right? It's of no concern to me. But yes, it is of concern to me because he is, at the moment, a public servant. And then he has implemented these policies that have devastated our economy, and now he can get up and run, right? He can jump ship, as the man said in the video. So when we talk about double citizenship and that, you know, we talk about, what's his name, um, Mark Golding, and how he can do the same thing. Yes, a dual citizen can do the same thing, but also somebody who is not a dual citizen can also do the same thing. And how do we know if Dr. Nigel Clark is not a dual citizen? Citizen, Nobody knows, right? Nobody knows who Dr. Nigel Clark is, really, because our media houses do not do a thorough investigation, a robust investigation of our politicians. They don't, right? They are in lockstep with what is happening in Jamaica in the political realm, and you know that. They are in lockstep. The media houses do not do their jobs. And that is why our politicians can do anything that they want to do and they get away with crimes. Because our media protect them and are in bed with them. So when I woke up yesterday morning and I looked at the Jamaica Gleaner and the Jamaica Observer, and what they had to say in relation to Dr. Nigel Clark's departure, they were ecstatic and thrilled, you know, and you from, um, what's his name? 
Bruce Golding, to Dr. Peter Phillips, to all of the GLP politicians. They are thrilled. They are ecstatic. They are, say, largely happy for him. And I'm sure they should. But the fact of the matter is, are they looking at the big picture? When we look at the superficial image, yes, as a symbolic gesture, as mere symbolism, it's good for Jamaica because here we have uh, a man of the soil heading to the IMF. But what is the IMF? What is the International Monetary Fund but a neoliberal institution, a neoliberal and neocolonial institution? And let me just say to you what neoliberalism is about. Neoliberal Neoliberalism encapsulates the ideology that you can go to an economy, that these you know, institutions, these multilateral institutions can implement policies that, of course, you know, there are three phases that they use to colonize, as it were, or to recolonize uh, a nation's um, country or resources, I should say, right? And one of them is when they go there, like the IMF, what they do, they seek to privatize public industries, right? The public resources, for example, uh, electricity. And that's what we're seeing now happening in Jamaica because that company, the Jamaica Public Service Company, has been privatized for so many years. It is no longer a public service that is being rendered. It is a private entity, it is a private corporation that seeks profit. And it is not about rendering service um, or trying to improve the service to make the service effective. They're not concerned about that. Their problem is just to, you know, give you some amount of service, however spotty that service is, and then they get their profits because they have signed off the to agreements with the Jamaican government, right? That has not or does not hold them accountable for their deeds. After they've privatized your industries, your public industries, right? What they seek to do also is to devalue your currency. And we can see where the Jamaican currency has been devalued for many years. And our dollar is like worthless, right? It's one of the worst currencies within the Caribbean region, if not Latin American. The Jamaican dollar is one of the worst, if not the worst currency. I think it's the worst. I think it seems to be worse than even the the Haitian currency, right? And our politicians are shameless because what they do, they represent, they are the faces of these multilateral agencies, just like what you see happening with Dr. Nigel Clark, right? No, so having privatized your public service industries, you know, and having these corporate, these international corporations coming and they're buying off for little and nothing, your, your assets, your national assets, then they devalue your currency and then they open up your market. They liberalize your market. That's why we call it neoliberalism in which it's nothing new, the free market economy in which they are going to flood your country with their products and you have to remove all sorts of taxes from them and they can flood your, 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 your market with their cheap goods, right? Because they're not paying any taxes. And their products are largely subsidized, right? And we have to bear the, the brunt of buying their stuff because it's cheaper. We can't support our local farmers because their stuff, you know, is not subsidized. So they have to charge you. They have to get some profits so they have to eat. And when they charge you to get to earn a profit so that they can buy and they can replenish whatever they've produced, then we begin to complain that their stuff is higher. So we prefer to buy the potato or the rice or whatever that comes from abroad. But it's to our detriment because if we're not self-sufficient, then we are a slave economy. And I think Jamaica is largely a slave economy because we depend on everything. Everything that we consume literally comes from abroad for the most part, right? So we are, we are de facto slave economy and it is the policies of you know successive administrations not only the jlp but the pnp government 
And that is why we have like the Dr. Peter Phillips and all of these people, political leaders are commending um, Dr. Nigel Clark. So we have the PSOJ congratulates Dr. Nigel Clark on IMF appointment, and that is coming from our today. So let me just share this with you quickly. It's a very pale print, but let's share it with you so you can see if you can see very well. So we have here the, we can see the PSOJ, they're very happy, the private sector organization of Jamaica, PSOJ has congratulated Dr. Nigel Clark on the announcement of his appointment as Deputy Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund, the IMF. So in a press release, the business lobby group hailed the appointment as a significant milestone, noting that Dr. Clark becomes the first citizen from Jamaica, the Caribbean and Central America to serve at such a level in the IMF's 80-year history. So we see here Dr. Nigel Clark and you know these representatives of the private sector, right? They, they are there and they're suggesting here, we're confident that his extensive experience and deep understanding of Jamaica's and Caribbean's economic landscape will significantly enhance the IMF's perspective on the region, the PSOJ outlined. Now, Dr. Nigel Clark doesn't have to tell them anything about what happens in the Caribbean because they do know, right? Their spies are on the land and they know everything that is happening. That's why they were able to go and to fleece funds coming from the National Housing Trust. The IMF was able to go there in 2013, 14, they're about, and fleece the funds from us because they are thieves. Now, commending Dr. Clark on his distinguished tenure, the organization said that as Minister of Finance and the Public Service, his adept management of the portfolio's responsibilities has contributed to Jamaica's economic stability and progress. And I would like to know what economic stability we have. If you have 80% of your graduates leaving every year, your most trained professionals are leaving Jamaica everywhere, and including him. So right now we see that Dr. Nigel Clark is leaving. He's joining in that sort of brain drain, right? So he's leaving Jamaica because he doesn't see a future in Jamaica. And that is a whole matter of dual citizenship. It doesn't have anything to do with anything. It's the, lo the loyalty, the commitment that you have for national development. We know that people like Michael Manley could have lived abroad. He could have lived in the United States. He could have been a professor there if he had wanted to. He could have been a very important, a journalist, an activist, right? He could have joined the same thing that, what's his name, that Kamala Harris's father did, that Donald Harris did. He could have gone to America and participated in the civil rights movement because Michael Manley at the core was an activist, a political and social activist an all-rounder, right? But he decided that he would go back to his country to fight for Jamaica's social, political, and economic rights and liberties, right? The problem with Michael Manley is that he changed, right? And he turned 180 degrees, you know, backward in 1989 when he assumed power or assumed his second term after he had lost the elections in 1980, right? He decided that he was going to pursue the neoliberal agenda, the Washington consensus. And the Washington consensus is about the privatization of your public industries, devaluing your currencies, your currency rather, and opening up your market. Right, opening up your market where you open up your market, you do not have any regulation, the deregularization of your market, where your market is deregulated. Right, that anything goes and they can flood your market with their produce, but you can't flood theirs with yours. And that is why we see that anytime Jamaica has a project to sell, whether it's Aki or whatever to the United States, they always come up with all of these rigorous and things, you know, um, procedures and measures that you have to take and you have to abide by. But they can flood your markets with things that are also not very good. But we have to flood their markets with the best of the best and we have to go through rigorous um, measures 
that they implement for us to get even a simple project, a simple, a simple product into their market, right? But we're seeing now where Dr. Nigel Clark, Nigel Clark, and not only him, but all of our leaders, be they PNP or JLP, they are for the neoliberal agenda. And that is why we have all of these political leaders and they are lining up. They are actually lining up to render. I Let me see if I can find in the Gleaner yesterday. Perhaps I can't, I'm not going to find it. Um, but in the Gleaner yesterday, they were all lining up, you know, and they were applauding Dr. Nigel Clark for his um, appointment for his, his impending appointment, that is, because he has not yet been appointed, but in October he shall be leaving. And uh, that is it. So the Gleaner and they had all of, I, I, I thought I had it here, but it seems like I don't have it. Um, but I did have the, it could be this. Let me see if it is this. No, it's, 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 it's not it. All right. So, but they were all saying how much they are, you know, elated. They are thrilled to have. Wow. Where did I put this? Where is this one? Hola, soy el abogado de inmigración Carlos Colombo, y hoy les voy a explicar cómo los Estados Unidos. Sorry about that. Let me see if I can get the sound on my my video. I can't see where it's coming from. Como siempre, me encanta poder compartir con ustedes wow. noticias sobre inmigración. Okay, it's Unidos. coming from here. ¿Y cómo pueden? Right, okay, so sorry about that. So we have here, um, you know, I can't, I, I am not, I don't have that, all of the platitudinous words that were said, right, um, by these political leaders who were commending Dr. Nigel Clark for his appointment, his impending appointment to the International, International Monetary Fund. Now let's look at this um, article here that was written by Al Jazeera. And it says here, our apartheid or in the World Bank and the IMF, right? And it said, these institutions were designed with colonial principles in mind and they remain largely colonial in character to this day. And this was written on November 26, 2020, right? That these institutions are still colonial and they have colonial policies. Most people assume that inequality between the global south and global north of the United States, Western Europe, Japan, Canada, and Australia has been declining over the past few decades. After all, colonialism is behind us and surely poorer countries are gradually catching up to richer ones. But oddly enough, exactly the opposite has happened. The per capita income gap between the south and the north has, quadru has quadrupled in size since 1960s in what can only be described as a striking pattern of divergence, right? So it has quadrupled. It has, you know, increased four times. The trend is due in large part to power imbalances in the world economy. To put it simply, rich countries have disproportionate influence when it comes to setting the rules of international trade and finance, and they tend to do it in what ways that serve their own economic interests quite often at the expense of everyone else, right? And this is what the, the, the article is saying, this author is saying, nowhere is this problem more apparent than when it comes to the distribution of power in the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, two of the key institutions that govern global economic policy. We might expect that representation in these institutions would be modeled along the lines of the United Nations General Assembly or perhaps calculated according to the population. But in reality, they are deeply undemocratic. Let me turn this off. Right? So they are deeply undemocratic. So when you hear me say that they're undemocratic, it's not because I'm using my own words. It is what it is. The problem starts at the top. The leaders of the World Bank and the IMF are not elected, but are nominated by the United States, the US, and Europe. According to an unspoken agreement, the president of the World Bank has always been from the US, while the president of the IMF has always been European. Right? So that's why we can see that they are colonial institutions. 
black. And even if they have a black face tomorrow, as they have a, they had a black face in America through Barack Hussein Obama, it doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean that that's going to change, right? Because that's only for symbolism. And then probably Nigel Clark might become the president one day. They might change their 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 um principles, not necessarily to change the core of the institution, but to sort of give you that illusion of inclusion, that your voices are being listened to. But what they're doing, they're seeking to destabilize, as it were, your economy. That is what they do. Look at what there is that the guy is saying here, the article is saying, if we look at the voting allocations in per capita terms, the inequalities are revealed to be truly extreme. For every vote that the average person in the global north has, the average person in the global south has only one eighth of a vote, and the average South Asian only has one twentieth of a vote. Right? Remember now that when we, you know, people slaves in the United States, you know, black people were considered to be three fifths human beings. So that is the sort of analogy we can use that we don't have a say. So Dr. Nigel Clark assuming or playing the role as one of the deputy managing directors at the International Monetary Fund has nothing to do with anything. Huh? He's just there or they have selected him. Not that he has been elected, he has been selected because they know that he has ravaged the economy of Jamaica. Right? And he has used his wizardry, his economic wizardry, to do that. And he has done a fantastic job of plunging that economy into utter chaos and poverty that will last for generations. Right? That will last generations to come. Right? That is what he that is what Dr. Nathan Clark has done. And we are not willing to say, you know, that that is what is happening. And Michael Manley, an interesting character, you know, one of the most progressive prime ministers in the 1970s, we can say that in the 1990s, he wasn't. Well, maybe, you know, intellectually he was in the 1990s, but, you know, from an active um, standpoint, he wasn't, right? He had started to encapsulate the ideologies of the neoliberal class. I wonder if I could find a clip here of Michael Manley and the IMF, just to re remind you of what he said. And this was said in the 1990s, right? This was said in the 1990s, when I think after he retired from office, I believe. So Michael Manley, even though he was you know, he had his ministers implementing neoliberal policies, right? He was not necessarily pro the, the country. Now, let me, I'm going to have you listen to Michael Manley and what he had to say about this neoliberal agenda, particularly the IMF, because the IMF and the World Bank and the IDBs, they are representatives. They are the neoliberal institutions of the whole neoliberal agenda the agenda to recolonize, as it were, the globe, right? Because the globe was colonized before under previous, um, or colonized by previous European colonizers, but now the United States is doing that because she is the reigning global empire. So she's recolonizing the world as it were. But in doing that, she's obviously exploiting them and seeking to dominate them in all facets of their lives. But let us listen to what uh, Manley is saying here. And this was when he was in retirement. He looked very old here and looked like he had retired. So whilst he was, you know, he had his government implementing these neoliberal agendas and he had opened the economy because Michael, Norman, uh, Michael Manley did have the Jamaican economy open up in the 1990s, which devastated, which was one of the policies that actually caused FinSAC to have happened, right? FinSAC did not happen out of thin air, 
right? It was a, both a domestic and a global policy. And that is what you've got to understand. All right, so let us look at what Michael Mann is saying here. Let me see if I can enlarge the screen so you can listen to him. First of all, you go to the private banking system and you see, well, can I get a private banking loan? Because I'm strapped for cash and need some support and I have been trouble paying my overseas bills. When the private banks won't lend to you, uh, then you've got to do something if you lead up a country. And typically what you've got to do is to cut back your spending in some way and try and get more money so that the impact of those cutbacks are not as severe as they otherwise would be. And it's at that point that you generally come to the IMF. What you really need is to sit down with them and say, look, can I work out a five-year program? And in the meantime, I am strapped for some cash. So can you help me up front get out of the cash bind and then put it in the context of a long-term development plan? And they said, no, long-term development is your problem. We are here only to see who do you owe the money to, why are you in a bind, and we'll lend you some money in a very short time frame at full interest rate to get you out of the bind. And they then impose upon you tremendous restrictions in what you can spend. Then we reach agreement on a set of measures, the budget, exchange rate, monetary policy on interest rates, banks, on maybe privatization, and say, yep, we think this could solve your problem. And you say to them, but if I do it that way, when I finish repaying you, I'm going to be in the bind all over because this can't solve my problem. They say, not our problem. But the whole idea was to set conditions which the government would not meet. And when the government failed to meet them, you would have to renegotiate a new one in which the conditions became tighter. So the IMF didn't say, cut out this education program or cut out this health program. What the IMF said is, you must spend only so much money on health and education. And the implication of that was that you had to cut out some programs. Essentially, what the IMF wanted us to do was to devalue our currency. That's the first thing, mm -hmm. to make our dollar cheaper. Right. They needed to expand their exports and uh, diminish their imports. And the best way of doing that is to make foreign currency more expensive. And since our society is so heavily dependent on imported food, mm -hmm. imported fuel, mm -hmm. imported books to go to school, imported medicine, when we devalue, the cost of those things we import go up to the citizens. And as a result, the economy today is much more under the control of foreigners not necessarily through direct ownership, but through the mechanism of debt. In the 1970s, we owed $800 million. By the end of the 1980s, we owed $4 billion. Nowadays, we owe $7 billion. So the debt is rising, and all the time the debt is rising, our capacity to export, to produce, is getting less. Right. So that is what, you know, we have to acknowledge that Jamaica before, even though we have never achieved the educated levels that we should have achieved, but we had a more, a much more educated and sophisticated populace than we have today. And we must understand that many of them also migrated along with their children. What we have in Jamaica now is a University of the West Indies that is just occupying space and the lecturers and the professors there are not grounded into progressive theories. And, and if they are, and even if they are, somehow they seem not to be able to express these um progressive thoughts and philosophies, perhaps in the classroom, but they cannot do so in public. Because you know, when was the last time have you seen an article? in the Gleaner, in the Jamaica Observer, or in any, you know, uh, paper that Jamaica produces, critiquing the work of the IMF and the World Bank. None will ever do that. And I dare you, if you write an article against the IMF, a critical piece in which you unmask the IMF, the Gleaner or the Observer, well, perhaps the Observer might, and you have to fight, you have to you know, be sending them, you know, until they perhaps 
cave in, but the gleaner is definitely not going to publish that article. Right? Because the gleaner has subscribed to that sort of economic policy, to that sort of economic agenda. Because, of course, the gleaner is controlled by private corporation or corporations. And that's why we see the private sector organization of Jamaica coming out and they're congratulating Nigel Clark for his the stunning job that he did with Jamaica's economy. And that is their perspective. And he might have done, let's be fair now, a stunning job as far as the wealth of the plutocrats are concerned. But it is definite that he has not done a stunning job as far as the Jamaica, the Jamaican peasant, the Jamaican working class is concerned. As far as also the productive sector of our economy is concerned. He has not done a stunning job. He has just performed, I would give him a C. And I think C is a very high grade, but just for the effort that he had to put in to the work. Right? But Dr. Clark has not done anything that was transformative to the Jamaican economy. Nothing at all. I think people are more you know, um, gloating, as it were, over his PhD and the fact that he studied at Oxford University. And what does that have to do with anything? At the end of the day, how is that going to improve our economy and improve the lives of our people? How is Dr. Nigel Clark going to the IMF, going to help Jamaica? How is it going to give Jamaica equal voice and also much more, what should I say now, power in the, in the IMF and in these multilateral institutions, none whatsoever. In the first place, if you don't have a functioning economy, an economy that is robust, an educated populace, nobody in the world is going to respect your country. And Jamaica has neither. It has neither an um a robust economy or an educate nor an educated class. Right? It has neither an educated class nor a robust economy. Right? So we're not going to be respected on the world stage. Right? We are not going to be respected on the world stage because Dr. Nigel Clark is going to the IMF. He's going there because he has done a wonderful job on behalf of the IMF. And they're pleased with his wrecking, his wreckage of the Jamaican economy. That's why he's going. If he had not duty dutifully followed what the IMF proposed, recommended the policies that they asked him to implement in Jamaica, they wouldn't have called him. They would not have called him. I am sure if Michael Manley, who was a very astute politician himself, no multilateral, these neoliberal institu uh, you know, institutions would never want Michael Manley to work with them because they know that he, he is outspoken and that he is going to defend the interest of working class people. Because these politicians were not just there to rack up wealth as our politicians, because, you know, Nigel Clark is now, you know, and he's now, uh, what not, not a role model, but he's, a, he's one of the, what do you call these people? Like the Nicki Minaj's and stuff like that. Right? The he's one of the stars, as it were, of the of the Jamaica's economy. Right? Because you have made him into one. Because you have no level of education and you can't sit back and look at what is happening. I was listening to a program yesterday by um Mustavis Smiley, an African American man. And he was suggesting the whole, when he looked at African-Americans in the United States, 
and all the economic indicators, social indicators too. Black people are way behind. Yes, he's saying individually, he can cite many black people who have progressed over the years, but collectively as a people on all indicators, they are way behind their white counterparts. So when we like to look back and say that things are better, better to what, right? Because when you look at the economic and social indicators, uh, perhaps all indicators in Jamaica, in comparison to our Caribbean neighbors, Jamaica lags way behind. Look at the GDP of Barbados. Look at the GDP of the Cayman Islands. Look at the GDP of Antigua. Look at the GDP of the Dominican Republic. And compare that with Jamaica's GDP. We are way behind. Right? And they have not called any of these finance ministers from Barbados or from the DR or from Antigua to be heading to the IMF. Right? They're not calling for these people. I think the only way the IMF could convince us that Dr. Nigel Clark did a fantastic job, and that's why they're calling him, is if he had really transformed our economy. And I'm not suggesting that we're going to become a rich economy overnight, but we could see, right, signs. We could see an infrastructure that he's leaving there on which we can build. But all we are hearing every day is that the economic st stability, we have macroeconomic stability, but the dollar is being devalued. People can't afford the cost of living. They can't even pay their electric bills. And we see where these corporate corporations are going down there and they're buying up almost all the resources. And poor people find it very hard to even eat a meal, a simple meal. I was listening to Lisa Hanna, and she was suggesting that people can't even buy, you know, chicken anymore. They have to be buying chicken back. They have to be buying parts of the chicken because they can no longer afford to buy a chicken in a country that can produce chicken. Right? All of that land that we have, the fertile land that we have in Jamaica, we can't have lots of chicken coops to feed our family and to feed the country and to make the goods at a price that people can afford, at affordable prices. We can't do that. We can't do that. It's above us. Because when you look at electric costs, when you look at cradle larceny, when you look at the whole crime problem, it's, it's just a lot that people don't want to invest in Jamaica. Right? Because there are just too many social and economic problems that we have there. And Nigel Clark has not put a dent in any of them or tried to, particularly in the economic realm. Right? particularly in the economic realm in which he sat or under which he presided. Right? He, he has not accomplished any of that. So that's what I want to say that, you know, Michael Manley, who was a progressive, and look at the P.J. Pattersons, and they were lauding, and, you know, Dr. Nigel Clark's appointment. All of them, Dr. Peter Phillips, all of them lauding his appointment to the IMF after he devastated all of them, including the Dr. Peter Phillips. They devastated our economy. Jamaica in 2013, when we inked out an agreement with the IMF, had the most austere economic policies in the world. The IMF imposed that austerity that no other country would have tolerated. But Jamaica. No other country would have tolerated such an austerity but Jamaica. Perhaps Haiti wouldn't have as much as Haiti is exploited. But Jamaica, under Dr. Peter Phillips, who is hailed to have been a very successful economic minister of finance, rather, we hail him as one of the best. 
for working for our slave masters, right? He's working for our slave masters, right? So now that and, uh, Dr. Nigel Clark was working indirectly with the IMF through implementing their policies because he wasn't running the show, right? Nigel Clark was not running the show. It was the IMF all the time. So they were actually running the show there indirectly through his efforts. And now he's going to the IMF to work with them. And he can showcase Jamaica, an impoverished nation, one of the most impoverished nations in the Caribbean. He can now showcase Jamaica to have been successful at impoverishing our people in making into making them poorer and to making the nation a destitute nation. And he can send private entities and private corporations over to Jamaica to buy us out and to further enslave us. That is Dr. Nigel Clark's agenda. Okay, and you've got to wake up and smell the coffee and begin to understand that Jamaica is not an easy place. It's not an ordinary country. Thank you so much for joining. I look forward to seeing you in another video. Please be sure to like and to share and to subscribe. All the best to you. See you then.